thank you everyone for joining. If you can see the screen so far, it looks like we have an entertaining evening ahead of us tonight. So um, anyway, my name is Haley Buckner and I am the Professional Relations Manager here at Elevate Oral Care. Again, we just wanna thank you all for joining us. And before we start, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. For those of you remaining online past 50 minutes, your CE certificate will be emailed within a few hours after the completion of the talk. So be sure to check your spam folder afterwards if you don't initially find it. And you are all muted, so no need to worry about any background noise. We'll also have time at the end for questions and you can submit your questions through your webinar dashboard and they will be tracked throughout the talk. We have hosted an extensive, an extensive series of free live CE webinars on many prevention topics. Each of these webinars were recorded and are available with free self-instruction CE at the web address that you see in the center of your screen, elevateoralcare.com slash elevatingcare. Be sure to bookmark this page and return often to see what's new in free CE. Also, if you have a topic that you'd like to see covered, feel free to suggest it by sending an email to info at elevateoralcare.com or by completing the webinar survey that will be sent out after the completion of this evening's talk. But for tonight's talk, we are honored to have two experts in our topic on not only minimally invasive care, but more specifically, minimally invasive care for molar incisor hypomineralization. Tonight, we get the pleasure of learning from both Dr. Jeremy Horsekeeper as well as Dr. Jeanette McLean. And allow me to introduce them both to you. So if you're not familiar with Dr. Jeremy Horsekeeper, he is the Director of Clinical Innovation at CareQuest Innovation Partners, an organization whose mission is to improve oral health for all by advancing innovation to transform oral health access and outcomes for undeserved populations across the US. He holds affiliations with the University of Washington and Dehia Bus Dental Therapy Pro Program. As a practicing pediatric dentist, biochemist, and educator, he is known for investigating the strengths and limitations of silver fluoride therapy and helping to develop smart fillings. His mission is to reduce suffering from tooth decay by driving the development of better treatments and preventives to stop dental caries and thereby create an easy relationship to dentistry for all. Dr. Jeanette McLean is a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatric Dentistry, fellow of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, owner of Affiliated Children's Dental Specialists in Glendale, Arizona, and mother of two. <laughs> she received her degree with honors from the University of Southern California in 2003 and completed her specialty training in pediatric dentistry in 2005 at Sunrise Children's Hospital through the University of Nevada School of Medicine. Dr. McLean has become an internationally recognized advocate and expert on minimally invasive dentistry, appearing in newspapers, magazines, television, and continuing education lectures. Most notably, she was featured in the July 2016 New York Times article, A Cavity Fighting Liquid Helps Kids Avoid Dentist Drill, which brought national attention to the option of treating cavities non-invasively with silver diamine fluoride. So thank you both so much for your time this evening and Dr. McLean and Dr. Horsekeeper, the floor is yours. Thank you, Haley. Hi. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for having us. <laughs> thank you really everyone for, for doing this. This is, a, this is a really important topic that um, we all wanted to come together. Oh, you can see on video if you want to know. Uh, can watch your every reaction to everything I say and watch you fall asleep. I mean, I want, anyway. Um, <laughs> Seriously, everyone, thank you for doing this. Thank you for showing up. This is an important, um, understudied, underappreciated, under um, uh, uh, disease, a problem that causes a lot of suffering uh, in children, and that we um, have some pretty darn good solutions for now. So, really, the call to action uh, for us is to share um, some recent breakthroughs on molar incisor hypomineralization uh, to help you understand what it is, some pretty big clues about why it happens uh, that, have, that have sort of been breakthroughs recently. Um, and then I will do a quick little show of what I do uh, with severely affected molars and then hand it off to Jeanette and she's going to show you a, a barrage of different treatment options uh, throughout the mouth for hypomineralization. So um, I also wanna give a shout out to um, Dr. Tim Wright who uh, I first really started learning about molar incisor hypomineralization, MIH, from. And he um, shared with me his slides very generously uh, on which I've based um, these, my 
sharing tonight. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say, as Haley mentioned, that I uh, do work for FairQuest Innovation Partners. Um, and I want to thank Elevate and um, Advantage and everyone else for helping me get to the point where I could start uh, contributing um, to the development of new and more technologies to non invasively treat and bring oral health care to people where they are. Um, so, again, MIH causes a lot of suffering. Um, teeth erupt with holes in them profound sensitivity and um, that that's why we're here tonight is that uh, it's a growing problem it's already a big problem it's a growing problem still um, and, and we need to know what we can do about it so um, first we will dive into uh, why does it happen what does it look like what's going on so what we see with molar incisor hypomineralization is already defined in the title of the disease itself molars usually only first molars and incisors, not canines, not premolars usually, um, sometimes uh, second primary molars and sometimes um, canine, primary canines, and sometimes second permanent molars. There's always defects that can happen. But in general, the pattern um, is really specific, as you can see in this image um, with the near all the blue ones in A, where you have these beautiful baby teeth, permanent teeth, but severely affected molars. Uh, you can also have minor um, or mild affected enamel. Uh, that can cause more of an aesthetic concern, uh, which Jeanette will share some solutions for. And so there's a, a wide variety of variants of uh, manifest manifestation, uh, even across the teeth in one person. Uh, so you can see here this patient had a severely affected uh, first permanent molar and less affected, but still pretty severe across the mouth. But I've seen teeth like this where one or two or three of the other molars were totally fine. Uh, so a pretty wide variety of impact. Now, to understand what this is and why it happens, it's important to contrast to other uh, tooth development problems. So <clears throat> other tooth development problems, such as amelogenesis imperfecta uh, and fluorosis, they really affect the entire dentition. All the permanent teeth uh, pretty uniformly, even if you have splotchiness from fluor fluorosis, it really affects most or all of the teeth, as opposed to just the incisors and just the molars. Um, and so there's a lot that we've learned from the different types of amelogenesis imperfecta, in particular, how um, the more uh, dismineralized or, or hypomature types um, leave protein in the enamel when it's formed, and that can cause um, the tooth basically falling apart, the enamel falling apart, or having opacities, which again can be anywhere on the range from aesthetic to causing severe sensitivity and susceptibility to carriers. But clearly this is a different disease than these developmental, uh, these other developmental diseases that have a genetic effect or a um, sort of a toxic effect uh, from, from systemic intake of things that are negatively affecting us. We have too much fluoride. So going back to the pattern of tooth development, there's something in common that the incisors and the molars have the permanent incisors and the permanent molars. And that is that between birth and six months, around that time of development, you have the initial mineralization of the permanent incisors and permanent molars happening. So you see the first um, signs of mineralization happening in the first molars around birth typically, and then incisors following very soon thereafter. Uh, this is an old chart from the ADA actually, when they used to say what plate it was and all that stuff. Nice to, to revisit some old old stuff. Um, but this tells us a clue that perhaps it's a, a timing thing, that there's something during that time when this part of the dentition is developing um, that is causing this, this disease from happening. When we look into development, another nice old text um, in my library, we can see that the mineralization of the second primary molars and the first permanent molars um, happens in a pattern that starts at the cusp tips and then proceeds um, into the central pits and the grooves and the occlusal. Um, and that it's this later portion that seems to be most commonly affected in molar incisor hypomineralization, especially molars. Um, and so this is around six months, this is around birth, what a molar starts to look like in terms of the mineralized component. And so what I hope you're starting to see reading between the lines here um, is that most of the mineralization 
uh, the first molars happens after birth, even the initial setting um, that then is is um, presumably when it is disrupted at that time, that's what ends up being problematic once the tooth actually erupts six years later. So it seems to be a time-based disease. Um, that there's something that happens at that time that affects the manifestation later on uh, once the tooth comes into the mouth. And that um, perhaps it's actually after birth uh, where the key events seem to be happening of mineralization. Um, now we're going to jump into like, well, what actually causes this disease? Um, there's been a lot of papers that are that are summarized in these references um, about different things, you know, that happen during the first three years of life, maybe during pregnancy, asthma, pneumonia, really severe fevers, uh, ear infections, upper re respiratory tract infections, um, issues with mother's milk, tonsillitis, et cetera, uh, that have been sort of poked at for, for a long time as potential uh, contributors or potential causes. Uh, I recall in, in my training that there was a lot of talk about antibiotics. Um, and I was surprised to see that these um, relatively recent papers uh, that really dug into the literature quite deeply, uh, quite exhaustively, seem to indicate that antibiotics and drugs are not the cause. This was this was surprising to me. So for fluorosis, we had an extrinsic cause. So <clears throat> exposure to fluoride, too much fluoride, while the teeth were developing, that um, affects the development of the enamel. And uh, what's being said here is that it perhaps is that, that there's no strong association um, with antibiotics. There's trends in some papers, but there's trends in the opposite direction in other papers. So perhaps there's something there at a key timing event, uh, which we will which we will get to. But overall, this is sort of the sense that is out there. We're going to dive into some of the figures from the Silva paper here, uh, which I found quite extraordinary and exhaustive in the representation of the uh, studies that have been done to try to trace back what's, what's going on here. This is what we call a forest plot without the forest view. Uh, long story, but basically they did an exhaustive literature review of every study they could find in English or otherwise, uh, either retrospectively, prospectively, or case control, assessing uh, the relationship of things like maternal medicine use, maternal illness, or maternal smoking on the incidence of molar incisor hypomineralization uh, once the permanent molars come in. And what we want to see, well, they decided not to do a meta-analysis, which is where you synthesize all these dots and whiskers into a overall gestalt, an overall um, concept of, of the statistical likelihood of this being real or not, causing the disease or not. Um, and if it was causing, it would be further to the right, it would be further on this side. What we see is that the mean and the confidence intervals of, of, the, um, of the risk the risk ratio here, uh, generally overlaps this line of no difference, this one line. So overall, this would suggest that maternal smoking is probably not uh, a cause. Uh, same thing here with maternal medicine use. And these studies here, maybe there's something going on with maternal illness where you see a handful of studies going where their risk ratio, so the, the relative risk of the kids whose mom, moms were sick when they were pregnant, seems to be perhaps a trend in about half of the study, so maybe there's something there. And this is going to be our formal meta-analysis synthesis of like what this looks like to Jeremy. Um, I'll just say this is you know not a formal assessment, but overall, uh, knowing that some folks are not as familiar with looking at forest plots, um, also knowing that they don't represent the size of the studies here, uh, but I did read up on them, it seems like maybe perhaps maternal illness has an effect uh, but not these other uh, considerations. So there's two more slides like this. Um, and here's about perinatal association. So uh, really having to do with birth. Um, so for prematurity, it's just, it's all over the place. So premature births uh, does not seem to be a significant effect consistently across all these different studies. Um, low birth weight, there are a couple of studies that found a significant association and maybe a trend. So maybe low birth weight might have some impact. Um, birth complications, there seem to be more kind of on this right side over here, so maybe uh, that would have an impact on MIH. And C-section overall, they seem to all overlap, you know, different slides and seem to, to be not an effect. Um, 
So this is kind of how we, we try to synthesize across all the different studies that have been done today. Uh, so maybe low birth weight, maybe birth complications. And then this last one I think is pretty interesting is that once the child is born, within that first year of life, or some of the studies in those first three years of life, um, <clears throat> did they get pneumonia? Did they get asthma? Did they have asthma early on? Uh, did they have a serious fever? And what kid hasn't had a serious fever, but apparently they're able to sort this out a little bit. Um, and then general childhood illness, just does this kid get sick more often? Uh, and that's been very standardized in the way that it's assessed. Um, and so overall, these things all seem to trend as potentially having an effect, which again supports this notion that we saw from the anatomy as maybe um, this is an afterbirth thing. Um, so maybe there's something that happens after birth where the child is impacted and then it affects their tooth development. So how do tooth develop again? Let's dive a little deeper back into that. Um, so this is a, a picture of some pictures of the teeth, the permanent teeth developing with the primary teeth are in. Um, but if you remember back to your um, embryology days, there's sort of that bud, cap, and bell stage of tooth development. And we'll, we'll start right at the end of the bell stage. So um, this, uh, I, was, I was able to help a fantastic scientist named Orifin produce these images uh, many, many years ago. And um, this is what the ameloblasts look like as they are making enamel. This is where something gets disrupted to result in MIH. Um, and if you look at the bottom, we're mapping to uh, sort of that there's these different stages of cell development. That there's the secretory stage where the ameloblasts are making the matrix and then there's the maturation stages um, where they are um, turning the protein matrix into enamel basically. Um, and so really, again, it's about this enamel tissue and how it's developed. So going deeper in, a lot of the mechanisms for enamel development have been further refined. Um, and so just to say that there's this secretory phase, there's this ruffled phase where the cells are you know, ruffled by ridges, uh, and then there's a smooth phase, it goes back to ruffled, back to smooth, back to ruffled, um, and then eventually they disappear. But there's all these different molecular um, mechanisms that happen along the way. Looking to another view, um, there are different mechanisms responsible for calcium um, signaling for calcium signaling within the cell, for calcium shuttling from outside of the cell into the cell, phosphate to get into the area where enamel is developing. There's all these different molecules involved, cal binding, cal modulating, calcium, all these different things. And so if you look at the title of the slide, so much can go wrong. So what is it? Uh, just to further emphasize the point, this is a different rendering of the same process where it's just like <laughs> there is so much going on when enamel is developing. And it's not a surprise that you can throw the protein out there and that something can go wrong in maturing the protein into enamel and making the protein disappear. So really just to say that there's so many different molecules, so many different mechanisms that are simultaneously acting and coordinated to produce enamel that it's not surprising that sometimes these things um, get screwed up. But what's interesting is that it would be so specific to certain teeth. So there just seems to be some key factor in timing that causes this. <clears throat> so if we look over time just in one country, shifting way back to trying to figure out what the hell causes, pardon me, what causes this. Um, in Sweden, it was cataloged that uh, the incidence of molar incisor hypomineralization like, tripled in four years and then went back down four years later. Why would that happen? So again, suggesting there's something external to normal development that, that's happening. If we look across the world at the incidence of this disease, hopefully you can see something jumping out at you immediately. The yellow is really low incidence. The purple is really high incidence. So what we see is that there's dramatic variation in the incidence of molar incisor hypomineralization and that uh, the good old US of A and Canada and I guess Greenland got uh, looped in with us. Um, has a dramatically higher uh, rate than the rest of the world by far. What's going on there? So if you look just at Japan, and I'm grateful someone did, um, this is the north. If you look at uh, Tokyo, sort of in the lower right here, um, what's interesting is that they have a big spectrum as well, where the further southwest, 
uh, areas have much higher, 28, 25% incidence of kids with MIH. And if you look to the Northeast, you have a lower proportion. Um, this has been tracked down over the years to correlating strongly with vitamin D levels. You would expect that it would be the opposite for vitamin D levels because the more sun exposure you have, usually the higher your vitamin D con uh, levels are in your blood. Um, but this is the opposite of that. The other way that you can get vitamin D is through nutrition. And usually you get vitamin D through fish. And Japan is a big place for fish, as uh, a lot of us sushi lovers know. Now what's interesting is if you look at sort of what the um, domestic products of the land use, of the farming use is um, across Japan, is that in the lower left in the southwest, um, you have a lot of wheat and a lot of rice production. And in the Northeast, you have less wheat, less rice production. Overall, people are living uh, more on fish. So is it possible um, that it's fish consumption or some other vitamin D source or some other nutrition source that is actually driving the, the lower incidence of molar incisor hypermineralization here and a focus on a grainy diet in the Southwest that's causing it there. Um, well, as it turns out, there was a large high quality clinical trial recently published just in 2019 uh, where they asked this question. They didn't ask about fish, they asked about vitamin D. But what they did is they took women um, who were, uh, knew they were pregnant by 24 weeks um, and gave them a high level of vitamin D. So 2,800 I use a day instead of the standard 400. Um, randomized them to that for the standard and looked six years later at the incidence of uh, enamel defects, of molar incisor hypomineralization, uh, and differentiated that carefully from intensive care use. And uh, what they found is that the children whose mothers took high levels of vitamin D during pregnancy had half the rate of MIH as the children of mothers who took the lower dose of vitamin D. It was highly statistically significant, extremely uh, consistent, um, and there's the paper says that there's a trend to less severity as well. So women who took high levels of vitamin D, about seven times uh, what's sort of been a, a standard supplement, um, their kids had healthier teeth permanently many years later. Now that's curious. Um, now, this reminds me of what I would argue is the most important text uh, in all of the history of oral health, uh, which is Nutrition and Physical Degeneration uh, by Weston and, and Florence Price. Um, and I won't dive too deeply into this, but just to say, if you look at these maps, this is South America, uh, Africa, and the Middle East, and Europe, um, the entire Pacific Ocean, all the islands, um, and then North America along the northern coasts um, in indigenous lands. What these folks did, what this couple did, is they went uh, to the end of the trade routes and surveyed um, people who were living on a uh, Western processed diet and went out to the bush and went to the villages and looked at people who were living on their native foods, on their historic cultural foods, um, and found just a very, very, very strong correlation between healthy teeth and caries. Um, and that's been, you know, that's been out there for a long time, but also what's sort of forgotten is that they also looked at malocclusion crowding. Um, and they found, again, a perfect correlation where, um, where if you look at the kids whose parents were on a uh, processed food diet during pregnancy um, and the first couple of years of their, of their life, um, they have, you know, they have this facial syndrome that we all see as naming braces. <clears throat> but people who grew up on their indigenous diets uh, did not. So um, it would putting this stuff together very quickly, it would suggest that perhaps um, having traditional foods, and, and I'll get to it, but having traditional uh, foods enables normal facial development. And without it, you have things uh, like a narrow face. Um, you have adenoid problems from constriction of the airway. Um, and you have molar incisor hypomineralization. Um, if you, so they did painstaking work to really look at the entire um, diet profile of all of these, it was like 72 different communities that they went to, uh, villages and all that. And the consistent pattern that they found um, was a focus, 
for the whole community on eating high, on eating animal fats, in particular high nutrient animal fats like liver, fatty fish, and grass fed dairy. Um, and that they were not able to find any um, cultures that survived, that grew normally, um, that did not have at least one of these or something very similar, like a big focus on egg yolks or something. Um, but that uh, animal fats were essential uh, to enable normal human development. And as you see for dairy, this could be, you know, green grass fed cows, it doesn't mean you have to kill the animal. Um, but that, you know, even in India, this is, this is a staple, this is required. Um, so that's where vitamin D is. It's in the fatty portion of fish. It's in the fatty portion of liver. It's in grass fed dairy. You don't need to supplement it if the cows are actually eating green grass. Um, and so when we think about what's so specific to America to have this hugely high incidence of MIH, um, you know, we look no further than your stores, right? We have this amazing, it used to be an amazing store called Whole Foods. Uh, that doesn't really have any whole foods anymore. I mean, they're there, but you have to look for them. And as we track back to this stage of development, um, sorry, the stages of development where uh, these seem to happen, this post-birth piece, uh, post-birth timing, the first year of life, while well, the permanent incisors and molars are first growing, um, perhaps it's the child's nutrition. You know, we have a much higher rate of bottle-fed children than anywhere else in the world. We have a much higher rate of non-breastfed children than anywhere else in the world. Maybe the formulas aren't good enough yet. Maybe that's what's causing this, is where we have you know, some variance in the susceptibility, some variance in the impact from fevers and other things that happen during child development, but ultimately, perhaps, it's a nutrition disease. And so I would just say, uh, save the food, save the world, change the food, change the world. Um, we're starting to have more and more evidence that these things uh, that we see in the teeth, in particular, are a result of what I would call malnutrition. And I think carries is a malnutrition disease as well. So um, to transition, you know, as dental providers, as oral health providers, you know, so what? I have a kid in my chair in front of me who is suffering from MIH. Uh, what can we actually do about it? Well, as a community, we can, you know, help people to understand that. All you have to do is increase your vitamin D levels uh, to a safe amount uh, during pregnancy, and you'll half this, maybe dramatically decrease the severity. Uh, but once you have the tooth, all right, what are we going to do? So uh, Jeanette is going to mainly focus on this, but very briefly, I just wanted to share uh, that we are starting to have solutions, and that's why I asked everyone to do this. So um, very commonly uh, in my the clinical practice that I do now, I see severe molar incisor hypomineralization. I put SDF, uh, just dabbing with cotton to dry, put SDF on, um, maybe don't even lay the patient back because they're so phobic from being so sensitive, um, and then have them back another time, dry it and put SDF, have them back another time and fill it with glass and um, That happened here, so you can see it's a severely affected tooth. This girl had not had ice cream in two years, I put SDF on once, just drying with cotton, and that was it. She came back and she gave me a hug after being so phobic when she first came. She gave me a hug and said, thank you for letting me taste ice cream again. I dried the tooth carefully, put SDF on, and said, I'm sorry, I know it's a big deal to come back, but you got to come back. Um, and then we, we put glass atom on and stabilized with um, the restoration with, a, with an orthodontic metal band. Now, in her other tooth, this is all the same kiddo. In her other tooth, what's really interesting is that I put SDF on when there was still gingiva covering the occlusal. And this is not glass atomer here in the middle picture. That is something else that's going on where maybe the, the protein matrix was still there or something, um, but it stayed and I sealed it a little further with glass atomer, uh, which you can see here in this fuzzy picture, but there was something very interesting going on there where we were able to have some mineralization uh, take place. Um, lastly, just there are clinical trials uh, that have validated this now. Um, this is a wonderful study from Turkey where they took, um, you know, moderate to severe, sorry, mild, moderate, severe uh, molar hypomineralization, treated either with SDF or SMART, and overall the sensitivity dropped dramatically. Um, so did they need to seal it also? I mean, why not if you can? But um, really dramatically decreased sensitivity uh, in a clinical trial. And so for my practice, we went from 
100% GA for severe MIH to no more GA and 100% SDF. With that, I'll thank you for your time and hand it over to my good friend, Jeanette McQueen. That was awesome, Dr. Horst. Thank you. I enjoyed that. Hopefully you can see and hear me now. And now I'm going to go, um, I think we'll switch over so that I can be the presenter and I will share my slides. Part two, now what? Now what? What do you what do? Is, what funny. do I do? And, and as I'm waiting for the ability to share slides, which I still sadly don't have. Oh, oh it's happening. It's happening. Okay. Phew. All right. Hello. Hi. There I am. <laughs> um, so I see this every single day. I saw a bunch of kids with it today. Um, and it it's can be very difficult to to manage some of the, the key things is there's the hypersensitivity, the severe phobia, um, poor bond strength, all these things that make treating teeth with MIH so complicated. Um, and I know you kind of went over this background, but I'm really going to focus on the, the clinical management. And there's way too much content. Like I could spend an hour on SDF. I could talk for two hours on hall technique. I could talk two hours on the cosmetic options. So this will be more of a brief overview of what are the new minimally invasive options that we have now. And I'll point you to additional resources like, oh, if you want to try this technique, here's technique videos. You can learn more about it. But just highlighting like the key options that we have. Um, but yeah, phobia, hypersensitivity, hard to numb, poor bond strength, recurrent caries for days. Um, and like Dr. Horst showed, we basically could do sedation. <laughs> so for example, this is a, a kiddo pre-SDF and, and minimal interventions where like I, I had very limited tools. So severe MIH on the first permanent molars terrified this kid was super phobic they've obviously had a lot of dental work all, already they had this awful uh, partial <laughs> um so i did oral sedation and i had referred her to the orthodontist to see about second molar substitution those are basically my two options back then i could have second molar substitution extract the first permanent molars or i could do stainless steel crowns and all of that of course was done with sedation. So in, in her case, they opted to just take out two of the teeth and then stainless steel crowns on the other two. And I did it with oral sedation and it didn't go well because even when you do a block, often they still have sensitivity. It, it, it's awful. And I mean, it, it goes to show in the, the treatment. I mean, granted, these lasted six years, but they're, they're not great margins. Um, and you can see they took out the upper first molars. The spaces have closed. So that's nice. But um, it left much to be desired. And of course, now I have options where I can do treatments on her front teeth that are non-invasive, whereas in the past, I'd be drilling this out and putting bondings. Um, you know, so, so looking back, it was stressful for me. It was stressful for the patient and the mom. Um, but that was the knowledge that I had at the time. Those were the options that I had. And I love this quote, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And, and now we really do have better options. So really quickly, you know, these kids have 10 times the risk of developing caries in the MIH affected teeth. So prevention is critical. Make sure that you're treating them with a fluoride varnish. Um, I like the varnish from Elevate, which is the Floramax because it has better uptake of the fluoride at half the concentration because we don't want to create fluorosis, right, when we're trying to cheat MIH. Um, and of course, SDF. Um, I also like MI paste because that I can use throughout the mouth to daily for, for hypersensitivity. I'll also show you later how you can treat uh, cosmetically in the anterior teeth with that. Um, and then for high caries risk, we do recommend prescription strength fluoride toothpaste. Um, but with kids, you know, obviously we don't want to give them uh, high doses. So I like Elevate has the metered pump where you can give them the, it's called Just Right 5000, where you can give out the exact metered dose of 5000 part per million toothpaste. There it is. Um, and I would encourage you, thanks to Elevate for putting this webinar on, you know, uh, you can reach out to them and they can do a lunch and learn for your for your team and educate everyone on SDF and the product so that everyone's on the same page, because that's really in, important. Because, um, of course, your your assistants, your hygienists, they're, everyone needs to be able to talk the talk. <laughs> um, Stannis fluoride also is good for sensitivity and to, for um, uh, wear resistance. Um, SDF 
for MIH, Dr. Horst already touched on it a little bit, but anecdotally, you know, normally we would dry with compressed air. Don't do that if they have MIH, just use cotton. So I'll use a, a cotton roll or gauze to dry the tooth. Um, there's no etching or rinsing or light curing. I really like, Dr. Horst normally will say, <laughs> dry, apply and say goodbye. That, that's my favorite. We should make a t-shirt. <laughs> Can we get a t-shirt? Totally do that. But yeah, dry apply, yeah. say goodbye. I do like to cover it with varnish as well. Um, you can get it, I get it in the bottles typically. Um, you can have unit dose. They now also have three little mini bottles. So we have these in all of the, the work rooms. So basically we have, we're, we're using SCF all day, every day. Um, and I have application tutorials that are on YouTube. So these are few to, free to view. You can train your staff with them, have patients watch them. Sometimes these kids are so petrified. If they can just see this and see the cute little baby, have her teeth painted and, and get that trust that you'll let them touch their very, very sensitive tooth. Um, so here's a kiddo I did very recently, uh, pretty moderate to severe MIH going on here. This is after the second application of SDF. So just anecdotally, what I've noticed is some patients experience um, same appointment relief. Like you put it on and the, toward the end of the appointment, you can rinse their teeth. Um, others feel it the next day. Sometimes they have discomfort when you apply it. I don't know what's going on there, but I have anecdotally have patients complain that it quote hurts as you're applying it um, and some kids you do have to apply it multiple times to actually achieve relief so sometimes it, you might be one and done and others you might have to do hit it a couple times before it actually decreases the sensitivity and this was so sweet you know we have so many of these stories that are touching but um, this little kiddo who was petrified I mean it took an hour for me to do one minute of of like an hour to, to negotiate with him to do one minute of SDF, but he wrote a, a thank you note later, which was super sweet. Um, now sealants, glass ionomer, love, 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 and I do tons of it. Resin does not properly bond to MIH affected enamel. Um, you're gonna see leaking, you're gonna see caries underneath. Um, people are so hyper-focused on retention, <laughs> sadly, when they think of judging the success of a sealant, but really it's about caries prevention and, and you really need to be sealing these teeth with glass ionomer. or please don't put resin sealants on MIH affected enamel. Um, and even if you think, like let's say you lose, use a low viscosity and there's some wear over time, it's still down in the fissures, it still acts as a fluoride reservoir. Um, using the conditioner is, very beneficial. There's literature to support that it enhances the chemical chelation and you have this nice chemical bond and ionic transfer between the glass and the, the two structure. Um, so here's different varieties of low viscosity glass. I use a lot of triage, um, but to be perfectly honest, if it's a MIH tooth, I'm normally putting something more durable. Like I would suggest at least a Fuji 9 or ideally uh, Eclea Forte, which is a glass hybrid. Hybrid. Uh, this is the most recent article I wrote on, like you can even do it on partially erupted molars um, because it, it, it's a hydrophilic material and it actually needs moisture to set. So it's very beneficial because these teeth start crumbling even even sometimes before they've erupted, you know, they're already missing portions of, an, of enamel. So it's good to put glass on them or as soon as you can or SDF like uh, Dr. Horst had showed you. I have multiple tutorials on YouTube where you can watch the step-by-step -step technique of uh, glass anomer sealant placement. And this is a beautiful study that came out last year in ADA, but a six year uh, look at school-based prevention programs. And guess what they used that helped to reduce caries incidents by 50% glass anomer sealants. And they were using Fuji 9. Um, make sure they're eating soft foods afterwards because the glass takes time to mature and harden. Here's a, a mild case, mild amount of MIH with cold sensitivity. They only needed one treatment with SDF. And then at a subsequent appointment, I covered the area with a glass ionomer with Equia Forte. And it can mask the stain quite nicely, especially if you do it at least two weeks later because there they will no longer be any free silver ions. So it won't stain the um, glass ionomer. Here's another one. Um, super sensitive. We in the past had tried to do resin sealants on her and pff, forget it. Like you can't blast those teeth dry, but like they'll jump out of the chair. So SDF helped desensitize them and then we did glass animer sealants. Now, as far as restorative options, um, atraumatic restorative treatment is fabulous because 
who cares that they're hard to numb because you don't even need to numb them <laughs> when you're doing art. Um, I do art all the time. Um, now, as far as why you've probably noticed recurrent caries or uh, debonding of your resin restorations on, on MAH, it has to do with the protein remaining in the enamel. Like it does not properly bond to resin, so you definitely want to use a glass dianomer, but this is a good reference for that because I'll have colleagues reach out to me and say, you know, I'm trying to get the office I work for, you know, to, to let me order a glass dianomer, and they won't let me, and uh, so I like to put these studies in there so you have a, a point of reference. And obviously I'm going through this all super fast, but Elevate puts all of these on um, YouTube and, and also on their website. So you can always reference back to this later and, and um, review anything that, that we may have gone over quickly. Um, single surface art in particular is it's highly effective, even better than in some cases than resins or um, amalgam and have a great survival rate. And there's high levels of evidence for that. So simple smart would be SDF. Now you might need to apply it a couple of times to reduce the sensitivity and then you could put Equia Forte to cover the grooves and any cavitations that might be present on the hypoplastic tooth. Um, and the material of choice, of course, is, is a glass ionomer. Ideally, I would go for uh, a high viscosity or a glass hybrid like an Equia Forte because it will release the most amount of fluoride. So here's an example over three years. Now, this is not an MIH tooth, but just showing you basic smart how durable it is. And it's, it's actually pretty aesthetic, too. So this is almost four years. And now this is an MIH-affected first permanent molar and you know there's a lot of misconceptions about glass but if you're using something like Equia you can use it for multi-surface restorations even with MIH affected enamel and have these nice long lasting restorations that don't get recurrent carries and don't get open openings uh, um, at the margin like you sometimes would see with with resin as it as it detaches from the surface um, and here's one the tooth hasn't even erupted yet and it it's um, has MIH, I treated it with SDF and then put Equia Forte. There's no numbing or shot, so you're not stressed out, the kid's not stressed out. Um, some of you may have seen this article. I try to share this a lot with ever on um, Facebook or whatnot if people message me on, on how to do this step-by-step, -step, but this would have details step-by-step -step on how to do um, what I like to call two-stage smart, where you're treating SDF initially to desensitize the tooth and desensitize the patient, because usually they're very, very nervous, and then um, placing an atraumatic restoration like a glass ionomer uh, later. Okay, so here's an example. This kid was only seven, and he couldn't even brush his teeth. Wow, we have 15 minutes. Yikes. <laughs> uh, he couldn't even brush, so I did SDF, and, and look at how bad the soft tissue was, because he couldn't brush. Um, but just from that and putting the glass animer with their, their antimicrobial, he felt so much better. And his look at how much healthier his tissue is. It's, it's really remarkable. I mean, yes, this is not an aesthetic restoration, but a lot of times they don't care. They just want to be comfortable. So it, it's really important to, you know, review the different options. And I have found a lot of parents are, are, are seeking less invasive treatment and are less focused on the cosmetics and more focused on trying to avoid sedation if possible and, and getting their kids comfortable and they're very appreciative and I do have uh, Elevate has this on their YouTube um, but you can watch this is like an hour and a half lecture just on smart techniques so if you want to learn about that in great detail this is a free resource for you where you could you can learn that um, Dr. Horst had shown an example of these, but another option, like if there's cusps breaking down or portions of the tooth missing, a, a, a next step um, beyond just art um, would be, it, like if you're not ready to go to the crown, <laughs> uh, which would be hall technique, and I'll cover that next, you can place a, an orthodontic band and then Equia Forte or some sort of glass ionomer. So here's an example where that, distal lingual cups was defective. I know it's hard to tell here, but I'm sure you've seen it where sometimes the whole tooth will look beautiful and then they'll just have one MIH affected cusp or where it just, it, there's like a void, <laughs> you know, pre-eruptive carry. So that's what was going on here. Um, and there's so much beautiful tooth structure left. I really didn't want to put an entire stainless steel crown on this guy. So um, I just did a band and then Equia, okay. So you can see me placing that. I'm also restoring the tooth in front of it at the same time. 
Um, so that's a nice option that's quick and simple to do. No sedation needed. This is Dr. Horst example that I already showed you. And you can mask a lot of that discoloration with, with the Equia. And this was also uh, published in the ADA journal. Um, this is a, another dentist case study. In, the, in their instance, they actually use the pink triage because you can apply that when the tooth is partially erupted and it's a nice color indicator. So you can, you can tell when and if you need to add more, uh, but putting a band and then glass ionomer. So this is a nice, what would I, I would call it interim um, restoration or, or atraumatic restoration. And the good thing is you're saving so much tooth structure. So then once they reach adulthood and they do want a quote unquote permanent uh, restoration, like an aesthetic crown, it'll be nice for the restorative dentist because they have all this tooth structure to, to work with and do a pretty, a pretty little uh, white crown. Um, so Hall Technique, of course, is fantastic for MIH. So if you really need full coverage, um, Hall Technique is the way to go. If cusps are starting to break down, um, you're gonna want full coverage. And there's high levels of evidence for the efficacy of Hall Technique. Um, I've been doing it for maybe five years now, but, um, you know, I had never heard of it before. It's more common in Europe and it really didn't make sense to me initially, but just seeing it done, you know, in a, in a nutshell, you're putting orthodontic separators that'll create that proximal slice that your burr would have created and then, uh, sizing and fitting and cementing a stainless steel crown, just like you would had you prep the tooth, but no local anesthetic needed. Um, so this is my most popular YouTube video is, is showing the hall technique. So if, you, if you're not already doing it or if you haven't heard of it, I think it's really helpful to watch this. Or if you have a phobic patient or a curious parent, it's helpful for, for them to see so they can get the concept of how you're putting a crown in a non-invasive way and not having to, to numb or prep or drill the tooth. Um, and then it would be contraindicated if you can't see dentin between the pulp tissue and the caries lesion, obviously it's not an option. Or if the kid is so wild and out of control, you worry about their airway, like if they're gonna swallow or choke on a crown, obviously it's not. Uh, and what I mean by seeing dentin is see how, here's the caries lesion, here's the pulp. You wanna ideally see at least a millimeter of sound dentin in between. When in doubt, put SDF in glass animer do an interim therapeutic restoration and check it again in a month. If it's asymptomatic and the root and bone look good, go for, go for the crown. I call that the litmus test. Um, separator placement, uh, I like to put them in at least two days so then there's more space and it's more comfortable to seat the crown. So usually two days to about a week. And probably the, my most popular question is what size crown, uh, separators? These are actually from Young, young Dental, uh, but I get them in two sizes, so a 1 8 inch and a 3 16 inch, and I do like the blue color, but this is what we get for separators, because I know someone is going to ask. <laughs> um, protect their airway. I like them seated slightly upright. If you have a little kiddo, you can put them in the, your lap and just raise yourself slightly higher than the parents and sit in a knee-to-knee -knee position. Um, crimp and, and fit them just like you would any other stainless steel crown that you're putting. Um, sealing the margins is critically important or you're going to get failures. So make sure it's a nice fit. So here's a, a tooth that abscess that I ended up having to extract because clearly the, the lesion was not completely sealed within the crown. Um, and make sure you're using a good high quality glass animal cement and don't be stingy. Fill the whole crown up. The bite does self-correct. That's the next most popular question on the hall technique is what about the bite? Well, here's a bunch of articles. The bite self-corrects it'll be fine. Don't sweat it. Okay. Um, so as far as a case study, here's, here's a beautiful example. MIH on a barely two-year-old. I did SDF initially. You know these teeth are just going to keep chipping and breaking down. They really need crowns. Um, and this lucky scenario, there's no contact, so you don't even need separators, but I just did all four stainless steel crowns in the same appointment in less than 15 minutes, avoided having to use IV sedation. Um, and then down the road, you see the other teeth erupting. And then I, I followed her for, for many, many years. So very successful. If you're not ar already doing hall technique, you definitely need to add it to your bag of tricks. Okay, so guess what? You can do hall technique for permanent molars. Guess what else? A little birdie 
told me that there is is currently a clinical trial under underway for um, Hall technique on permanent first molar. So of course in children, you know, the teeth are still erupting and the, and the bite will uh, adjust. So um, now if you have an adult, you could put a band in equia, but yes, you, you can do Hall technique on permanent molar. So here's an example where even with some SDF and equia, you see some uh, marginal breakdown. This obviously needs some to be covered with, with a crown. So your separators, clean this off crimp and size the crown and cement. This is so much less stress than that other gal that I showed you at the beginning of my slide deck where I was sweating bullets and everyone was crying and <laughs> this is so much better. It's a whole new world. So if, if you don't already do hall technique, I have tons of information about it on my website. I have a class on Dental Town. There, there's lots of resources you can find on, on hall technique. Now let's talk um, cosmetic options just in this last little portion here and we'll do questions. So um, etch and MI paste is a great one. Dr. Tim Wright has written the best paper on, on the on the topic. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm getting mixed up. I'm thinking etch bleach seal. I'm gonna get to that. Etch plus but MI paste first, my bad. Um, so you can use MI paste for some of these um, more superficial without the brown and yellow etch bleach seal, the Dr. Wright technique that I'll do later, that's like if they're yellow or brown. But you can etch these just with conventional acid etch, 37%, and have the patient apply MI paste nightly. Um, and you can get rid of some of these spots. So uh, at the office, I etch them in pumice and then apply it for five minutes. Now this is him, this is over four years later. So he's finally in braces now, but you can see it gets it was a permanent change. So it, it's pretty impressive. And this is the least invasive and it's actually natural remineralization. So etch plus MI paste. I have a technique video on YouTube that you can watch. And then GC America has resources and I, I have all of those linked that you can download it for free off of my website. So super easy. You can actually delegate this to assistants and hygienists as, as well. So this is a great little trick. Um, the next one I like to do is resin infiltration. So you're using a highly fluid resin that'll permeate into the pores of the tooth. Okay, so I do this for decalcification. I also do it for MIH. The great paper on this was Sinistraro. Um, that was in the ADA journal. So if you wanna read it in more detail, this is the go-to paper. So here's someone with MIH. It, it was interesting, the dad only wanted to do the one like worst, brightest tooth. Big takeaway that I wanna teach you specifically for MIH is often these lesion bodies are very deep. So that's why like just doing etch and MI paste is not gonna cut it. Even doing just etch bleach seal sometimes isn't gonna cut it. This lesion, lesion body is deep. So a trick is when you're, after you've etched sufficiently to open the pores of the tooth, you wanna apply the infiltrant. Normally you would only apply it and let it absorb for three minutes and then cure it. You can continue to apply it for longer than three, three minutes and let it get deeper into the tooth. So that's like, look at her facial expression. <laughs> I think this was after nine minutes instead of just three minutes. And another trick is I will cure it initially from the palatal aspect just to help draw it toward the light. And I have step-by-step -step clinical tutorial for ICON specifically, but those are, those are the two tricks for MIH specifically, longer infiltration absorption time and cure from the palatal aspect initially. Um, tons of stuff that you can get. There's a whole ICON page on my website where you can download the post-op instructions, patient information. Here's a bunch of MIH cases, but it's, it's pretty impressive what you can do because this will actually get deeper. Um, into the tooth and the code in the US at least is 2990 for resin infiltration. Now Dr. Wright's article, sorry about that. <laughs> so etch bleach seal, uh, here's the paper. You wanna use at least a 5% sodium hypochlorite. So like actual bleach. So not whitening product like a peroxide base, but actually sodium hypochlorite bleach bleach of at least 5%. So after etching with just conventional 37% um, phosphoric acid etch, you can apply beach bleach. I do it with a little micro brush and just rub it on there anywhere five to 15 minutes. This kiddo only took five minutes and I was able to get the brown out. Um, and then you want to seal over it so that it doesn't uh, uptake any organic stains. Um, you can seal it with a clear 
sealant. So this is the clear Delton pit and fissure sealant, which is the same one that Dr. Wright used in his paper. Um, so here's a kiddo. Now, honestly, I think this is fluorosis. So the, the stains are more superficial. So um, what you can do if you have someone with some brown discoloration and you suspect it's MIH and the lesion body is perhaps deeper into the body of the tooth, um, you can combine them. And what you simply do is the icon technique, do your etching. And then when it, just before you're going to actually put the resin, what you would do is apply your bleach. So do the bleaching part, you can etch again, and then finish it off with the icon resin instead of sealant. Because sealant, it doesn't have the same penetration coefficient as the icon infiltrant. It cannot get as deep into the tooth. So the aesthetics are, are different and that's it. Something superficial like this, it doesn't matter. He was happy. That was a nice, inexpensive, quick and easy thing. It's been almost four years for him and it, and it looks nice. Um, I have lots of content on that on um, YouTube and on my website. If you want to learn about that, you can look at a bunch of cases on my Instagram, which is at Dr. McLean. And then my website where they have literally every technique we talk about, I have videos and content on my website, kidsteethembraces.com, like if you want to see them in more detail. Um, and then the YouTube channel is Affiliated Children's Dental Specialist. Wow, that is the fastest I've ever done 140 slides. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Woo! I, I should become an auctioneer. Be able to have it all sold. All right, so cool. Now we can look at the questions in the chat if there are any. I don't see any in there yet, but. Yeah, I've got some questions, questions I can feed questions. to you guys from the question Perfect. tab. But yeah, thank you guys so much. You gave a, a bunch of information in not a lot of time. So that was awesome. We appreciate that. And for all the listeners listening, we're going to open up um, here for questions now, but you have all stayed your length to receive your CE credit. So, of course, don't feel obligated to stay on. But if you have questions and want to hear some of the questions that have come through and the answers, we'd love to have you stay on and appreciate uh, Dr. McLean and Dr. Horsekeeper for sticking on with us and answering a couple of questions here. All right, so we'll kick it off with this one. Um, it says that vitamin D has been shown to be a link, and you mentioned formula and illnesses as potential links as well. Are there any other known dietary factors that contribute? Oh, not known, nothing that's been tested. Um, but there, there is um, evidence of vitamin K2 uh, as an overlooked important developmental vitamin from, from that old Weston Price book. Uh, he called it the X factor. Uh, it was before the TV show, and, um, <laughs> and yeah, apparently vitamin K2 seems to be really important for for development. But but most of the vitamins are vitamins because they're essential for development. And uh, just the question is, you know, when when and what are we supposed to eat? And and all all historic cultures um, had a special diet that women would would have. You know, basically after they got married. Uh, you know, when they're pregnant and all that, and then that special diet, like always included eating fish, eating liver, yum, <laughs> all that mm, good stuff. I don't know if you can kids in the background, they're, uh, they're really excited about those hepatocytes. <laughs> Just keeping it real, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but obviously there's something else that, that's there that is waiting to be discovered. Um, but I think by focusing just on, on real foods again, we can, we can spend the time to figure out what the exact uh, ingredients are, but we already have the answer in hand, I think. Mm -hmm. And I suppose yeah. it's just oh. anecdotal, but I, I definitely have noticed in like my twins and, and preemie patients a higher incidence, but I, I, I don't have a formal study. That's just my observation, you know, when you're really? thinking, hmm, because the parents are always like, why, why, why? And we don't always know why. And that, that, it just, yeah, part there's of the a lot that can go part. on. Totally. Yeah. There's a lot that can go wrong during development teeth. Yeah. There's not the right nutrients there to support it. And, you know. All right. Well, thanks for that. Another great question. How can you differentiate MIH from caries and other developmental conditions that you guys have mentioned? Are there easy telltale signs? Do you want me to grab that one? Um, well, the earlier you see it, the easier it is to tell the difference. You know, sometimes we see kids where it's such a late stage where the tooth is so rotted and broken away. You don't know if there was MIH there initially so that that you may never know. 
Um, granted, like if the, the age is unusually young, you could, you could suspect that maybe there was some sort of enamel defect that lend itself to such a severe rapid breakdown of the tooth. But typically you can tell as soon as the tooth erupts and you will see those um, discolorations. So whether it's a white, you know, an opacity or it could be cream or yellow in color or brown. So normally you can tell by looking at what enamel is intact and if that is discolored, then that that is basically the telltale that there is MIH going on. Um, versus with, with caries, typically you're gonna find it at points of contacts proximally or in fissures, you know, somewhere where bi the biofilm is gonna get trapped and then it has that typical caries pattern and look to it. Any Anything to add on that one, Dr. Horse? Not, not really, yeah. I was just going to add the anatomical distribution of, of where the affected tooth structure is, but you, you, you got that part, so totally. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, do you guys uh, find that you bill more for MIH treatment, or is it just the same smart fees or hall technique fees? Isn't it a funny situation we have in dentistry where you actually don't have to do any diagnosis to uh, do treatment or get paid for your treatment? So. Um, <laughs> I don't think, I think if you do, uh, there's this amazing genius. She always says, um, bill what you do. Uh, oh, that's Jeanette McLean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill what you do. Yeah. I, there's nothing, nothing. I, I chart it. So we'll, we'll write down, you know, like we use Dentrix. So it's charted in there what the condition is, but, um, we bill it just like as we would how we do treatment for for any tooth really um but there's no i'm not sure if you meant like if there's an additional fee or something like that well kind of what I, yeah. some, Jeanette you know sometimes you're, you're saying the um resin infiltration or some of the other um advanced techniques sometimes take a long time so maybe oh, you could speak true. to do you bill for your time if it's going to be like a 45 minute or a 30 minute or a five minute right so resin infiltration of, of MIH affected teeth in the anterior, I mean, it takes you a good hour. So, you know, typically we charge comparable to a one or even up to a four surface resin, just depending on me guesstimating <laughs> about how long I think it will, will take, take it. But normally it's based on the, the procedure completed as opposed to the time that it takes you. Um, but it, it's hard because right now there, there's only one insurance company that I know of that reimburses for ICON and the re reimbursement is so ridiculously low, it would barely even cover the assistance and the material. <laughs> you know, like they want to reimburse you $40. I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I can't do resin infiltration of a MIH affected incisor for, for $40. I would like literally lose money. I would go out of business. That's, that's the other sad but true fact about be especially in uh, private practice is the reimbursements are are scary low sometimes where it's it's not um, sustainable. Sure. Okay. Um, as you anticipated, Dr. McLean, there were some questions coming in with the ortho bands. Um, I oh, knew it. Tom <laughs> <laughs> uh, just how do you cement the ortho bands? How would how do I place them? So uh, there's two ways you can. There's a tool like a lot of ortho offices have a, a separator placement tool. It almost um, you know kind of <laughs> like a tong looking thing. That thing freaks me out. I'm always in my mind thinking like, oh, what if the band breaks? And what if I poke the floor of their mouth? That that's just me. But the ortho assistants are so good and fast mm -hmm. at using them. God bless them. Um, so I just do old school and I just put two pieces of floss. I thread it through the separator and I use that to floss it into the contact. And what I do is I have the parent watch me place it and we give them a little coin envelope with extra separators and floss to take home. Because once in a while, um, the kid might accidentally, it might fall out with something that they ate or sometimes they're annoyed by it. So they pick it out <laughs> deliberately and then they have to replacement. So it, instead of wasting chair time with emergencies of having them come back and having to put it in again, blah, 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 the parent can just do it themselves at, at home. Um, but if, if you go on my YouTube channel, there's a video where I'll show it, I show it in detail and, and you can see me place it in on a, a patient, but basically just floss is, is super easy to, to do it. 
Awesome. Okay. And then I know, as you guys can imagine too, a lot of questions came in with the vitamin D. So going back to vitamin D and knowing how important it is, what about vitamin D from sunlight? Does that have a similar effect? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you can do to get the vitamin D levels that you need. Uh, certainly that, that is a possibility. Um, there was this, uh, there was this paper, I think it was like 2008, where uh, Philippe Pujol looked back through all these um, studies that were done in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s that showed that vitamin D prevents caries, uh, prevents cavities, quite profound uh, effect. And, uh, and it, it showed vitamin D2 supplementation, vitamin D3 supplementation, and UV exposure. So people were literally getting into tanning beds and getting <laughs> caries prevention. Uh, and, and Philippe is a, is a naturalist. I've, I've been to his home. He like cooks from Whole Foods. He's this Belgian guy who's very focused on nature. And so I say, you know, like, well, you just figured out that a supplement prevents caries. What do you tell your, what do you tell your patients? He says, eat fish, run around naked. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> I'm, and I'm, tapper, I'm typing in the chat what the exact separators that I buy, just FYI. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Behind the scenes. <laughs> All right, another question came in about um, have calcium phosphate products shown any benefit in treating MIH? I know Jeremy is, or Dr. Horse is not the biggest fan, but me personally, I, I use it. That's my regular toothpaste. I use the MI Paste 1, and I found that the sensitivity re relief was superior to Sensodyne. And I, I have patients with MIH where I'll, I'll have them use that just as their regular toothpaste and it helps with their sensitivity. I like that it doesn't stain, you know, because they, they, they can use it in the entire mouth. And then like that case I just showed you where I etched and put the um, MI paste. I mean, it seems like something happened, <laughs> something magical. Um, so I, 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 I think it works. Yeah. Yeah, it sure looks like it. I, I'm only, um, you know, against it like the ADA is for for treating or preventing caries. You know, there was okay. a lot of focus on that, and it's just the ADA has recommended against it uh, for uh, for treating initial caries lesions. And as soon as the prevention um, guideline comes out, I'm sure they'll say the same thing for caries prevention. But it seems to work great for sensitivity. And yeah. just look at Jeanette's cases; it seems to really right. help and, and lesions sometimes disappear. It's sometimes it's just that the the studies don't exist and not so much that it doesn't work so kind of like how we use sdf for proximal lesions that are non-cavitated like we know it is effective and we see it be affected but it's also not recommended by that same guideline you know when we when we know you can use it but there's just there was nothing published on it um so there, there's less evidence but there is there is some evidence for the the efficacy of it of the cppacp for sensitivity and, and aesthetics. Um, and, and for caries. But yeah, I mean, the, the evidence for SDF, of course, is much stronger and there's a lot more of it for, specifically for, for caries. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. We might be wrapping it up here with one of the most important questions of the night was, um, Dr. Horse, your, your finger puppets that you showed at the beginning, do they have names? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot to put my hat on to be. A... Oh yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> we were really oh, having fun. Before. We were having fun. I don't know. I don't know. This is this is Tigris and this is Euphrates. Uh, I don't know. No, they don't have names. <laughs> we make up new names every time. <laughs> I have right. a drawer here full of little toys for when my kids come while I'm doing webinars and things like this. So that they can be distracted. It's my, I have a lot of secret weapons like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very nice. Well, thank you guys so much um, again for your time this evening um, for and for a wonderful presentation. And thank you all who are listening in and joining and sticking around a little bit past the, the top of the hour here. And to our guests, your CE certificate will be emailed automatically within about an hour or two. And again, be sure to check your spam folder if you're not finding it right off the bat. And then also be sure to follow Elevate Oral Care on Facebook and Instagram for links to new free contained education events. The link that you can see on the screen gives you access to our archive webinars, um, including this evening's, this evening's webinar, which should be accessible in just a few short weeks. So please share that link with any of your staff and colleagues.
And then finally, on our Elevate Oral Care website, you will find buttons to request an informative CE eligible staff meeting for your office. Education on the latest evidence in oral health prevention is what we do and are passionate about. So we are honored to meet with you and your team and help you best serve your patients. So thank you all, stay safe and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you so much. Rock on everyone, thanks so much.